morning, Ballard Church. My name is Brian Lujillo. I'm an ordained elder in the Free Methodist Church, and my family and I recently moved up from Southern California here to Seattle. Uh, I'm the new dean. I took this position at Seattle Pacific University to be the dean of the School of Theology. Prior to that, I was a professor of theology and ethics at Azusa Pacific University. I love what I do. I get to teach and help people think about God with God. Uh, and, and it's a, a lovely privilege to do what I do. I'm deeply grateful to Pastor Lance for inviting me to share with you this morning. To begin this morning, uh, what I'd like to do is invite, make this kind of a family affair and invite my eldest daughter, Lyndon, to read a gospel passage for us today. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew from the first chapter, starting in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no maternal relations with her, until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus, word of the Lord. Thank you. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. For Christians around the world, this season of Advent is meant to help us prepare for Christmas. Now the word Advent comes from the Latin Adventus, which means arrival or, or coming. God is coming, and hence Advent. Advent is the four seasons before Christmas, the four Sundays before Christmas, and today is the third Sunday. Donald Hines talks about Advent this way. He says this, Advent is a spiritual discipline, enabling the attention that must be paid, an antidote to the powerful narcotic of the market. When every season of the year is homogenized into commerce, when shopping cannot be interrupted, society loses touch with former times and cannot find the way to hope for radically new times. He continues saying, the practice of a sacred calendar becomes a mode of resistance, a mode of resistance to the relentless claims of every day. To number the days until Christmas as holy becomes a subversive enterprise. The Advent Christmas epiphany season, he says, like the Old Testament Sabbath, aspires to return to the great rhythms of creation and salvation. To re reclaim the Christian year is to be reconstituted by an alternative narrative of human life. To take a parallel instance, Jews do not keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath keeps Jews. And so he concludes saying this, the idea of Christmas liturgies, practices, is to set worshipers free from bondage to the ephemeral and to themselves. I really like what he has to say there. He's pointing to this new rhythm, this different rhythm that we're meant to practice to get us out of our rhythms of commerce that Christmas also in the market wishes for us to participate in. Now, as a, as a professor, as, as a teacher, I, I like to have props. Uh, they're kind of my, my teaching toys. And I brought some of them to help us think about the coming of Jesus. Now, th th this is the Advent wreath we have at our dining room table. It's an Advent wreath. And an Advent wreath usually has five candles. 
Usually there's kind of three purple ones and one pink one and then uh, a larger white one in the center. And each of the Sundays of Advent, you light one of these. And then the next, and then the next, and the next. And then on Christmas Day, you light the, the white candle, which represents the, the Christ candle, the light of Christ. Now, when we put this on the table, I also like us to think each Sunday about how we can prepare. And, and we do that with some figures. So the first Sunday of Advent, this first purple can, candle, it, we also associate it with a prophet, or the prophets that point us towards the coming of God, and, and particularly Isaiah. And in the reading that we heard, Matthew cites Isaiah chapter 7, who points to God with us, Emmanuel. On the second Sunday of Advent, John the Baptist is also an important figure. And he is wanting to prepare us for the coming of the Lord as well. And, and his candle is meant to help us think about how we are repenting and, and dealing with our sin in such a way that the way of the Lord is being prepared. The third Sunday of Advent, and that's this Sunday, usually in these Advent wreaths you have a pink or rose candle. And, and it makes us think of kind of the Holy Family, and particularly Mary, and, and the joy that she has uh, come, I mean, being, being overshadowed by the Holy Spirit with the baby Jesus in her womb. And so it, remembers, it reminds us of the joy of the coming Lord. And then next Sunday, the last Sunday before Christmas, we think of kind of the, the people of God, the shepherds in the field, who came to worship Jesus. Now all of these Sundays prepare us for the coming of the Lord, baby Jesus. And that's the first coming. But as we prepare for this first coming, we also have our sights guided by these biblical characters to the second coming. There's two comings. This, these, this tradition, this practice of the Advent wreath and other Advent traditions are meant to get us ready. But why do we need to be ready for Christ's arrival? What do we expect when Christ arrives? In the passage that Lyndon read for us, we were told that the child that was arriving would be named Jesus. He would be named Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. We are waiting for salvation. We are waiting for forgiveness. We are waiting for Christmas. We are waiting for Jesus' return, his second coming, his second advent. Take a moment and think, what are we preparing for right now? And what is the salvation you are seeking today? In Matthew's Gospel, the first chapter begins with the genealogy of Jesus, and it highlights that Israel has experienced exile, the Babylonian exile. They've been displaced from their home. And for centuries, Israel has been under foreign occupation. And so it makes sense that Israel had hopes for political liberation. When they thought about the coming of the Messiah or the Christ, they would commonly think of a new son of David, a warrior who would rule and unite Israel. And if this expectation is true, then the story Matthew tells us is really truly remarkable. Not only does Matthew tell us that the beginning of Jesus' life is shadowed by a potential divorce because of an illegitimate 
pregnancy, but that an angel tells Joseph, a son of David, that the child in his fiancée's womb is to be named Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. From their sins. That last statement to a people under foreign occupation should come as a great surprise to us. We would expect you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their enemies, the Romans. But instead, we are told that the Messiah is coming to save us from ourselves. What might it mean that Jesus' task is to save us from our sins? I wonder. I wonder what sin is and what sin does that we need rescuing from it. If you go back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve on that eventful, eventful day in the garden, we were, are told that they disobeyed. They disobeyed and almost immediately they were ashamed. They learned that disobeying God, their father, created a fracture in their relationship with each other and with him, so they hid in the garden. They hide. When God walks in the garden, his question is, where are you? Because now they're not in the right place. They're out of place. They're hiding. And this is because sin isolates Sin isolates us. It makes us guilty, but it also makes us feel shame. Shame is, a, is, a, is different than guilt. Adam and Eve were told were ashamed. They did not say we are guilty. We did a bad act. They ate the fruit and looked at themselves again, and what they saw made them think we are bad. And that is shame. One way of thinking about the difference between guilt and shame is to say that guilt is thinking I did something bad while shame is thinking I am bad. And that is a real problem. And so I wonder, I wonder if part of Jesus' mission to save us from our sins in part is to dispel the lies of shame and fear that often hold us captive and isolated. The sins that have separated us from each other and from God. Shame tells us that we are not good enough, and there's lots in social media that helps, like Instagram, Facebook, and now in the mail we get the beautifully staged pictures on Christmas postcards of families smiling. We're told often that we're not smart enough, that our diplomas or degrees aren't the right ones, or we need more. And we're told by magazines, the mall, and TV that we're not handsome or pretty enough. This is about shame. Shame tells us also that our mistakes are unforgivable. Shame tells us that our past will rule our future. You can't get away from your past. And shame tells us that we are not worthy of love until whatever you fill in the blank. And so our sins isolate us in shame. Our sins lead us into exile in the same way that Adam and Eve are dispelled, are are kicked out of the garden. Now there's distance from them and God's presence like there wasn't before. And in exile, we find ourselves in a place where we tend to live lives where we are fearful of others, impatient, anxious, depressed, insecure, Because we're not home, and we feel deeply alone. And so Matthew tells us that Jesus the Messiah comes to save us not from our enemies, but that he saves us from our sins. Jesus has come to save us from that, from isolation. Jesus has come to love us. So if you feel inadequate in your life, if you feel no one loves you or you are not lovable, Matthew says you're wrong. 
to understand l- this love during this Advent season, I, wanna, I want us to briefly meditate on this icon. I love this icon. It's the, the Mother of God of Vladimir. And it was painted in the 11th century in Turkey. And as you look at it, I want your understanding of the birth of Jesus to be helped by this icon. This is an image of tenderness, not of military strength. This is an image of the intimate and extraordinary love revealed in the birth of the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. It is in the flesh. It is God in the flesh. And we call that incarnation. The incarnation is God becoming flesh the child. Here is the God that comes to save us, to embrace us, to wrap his hands around our neck, to put his mouth next to ours, to share his breath. He snuggles his face into ours and declares, I love you. I love you. I know you, and I love you. Here we see an image of the incarnation. God becomes human so that he can have hands to embrace us and hold us. He has hands to touch blind eyes, hands to touch sore wounds and diseased bodies, hands to touch lives racked with shame and guilt, and hands to embrace the object of his love, you and I. The churchman Rowan Williams describes this image like this. This is a little bit of a longer quote. But it's worth reading. The Lord does not wait impassive as we babble on about our shame and penitence, trying to persuade him that we are worth forgiving. His love is instead that of an eager and rather boisterous child scrambling up on his mother's lap, seizing handfuls of her clothing and nuzzling his face against hers with that extraordinary hunger for sheer physical closeness that children will show loving parents. God is not ashamed to be our God, to be identified as the one who is involved with us. Here, though, it is as if he is not merely unashamed, but positively shameless in his eagerness, longing to embrace and be embraced. It is not simply that God will deign not to mind our company. Rather, he is passionate for it. The image of God's action we are presented with here is of a hungry love. A hungry love. That's why I love this icon. It teaches us something about why God comes. Why does God come to us? He has a hungry love for us. Jesus comes to tell us who we are and to whom we belong. And so do not be trapped by the lies of sin. Jesus says, you are my beloved, and I am passionate for your company, and I have a hungry love for you. You are not created to be perfect. You are not created to raise perfect children, to bring sexy back, to have a boyfriend or girlfriend, you name it. You were not created to be successful and have an overflowing bank account. You were not created to be isolated and alone. But you were created from the divine, eternal love of God for love. You are created in the image of God that delights in creation and cares for it. And you are created for a love story. Be vulnerable to that love. Rejoice. God has come to forgive us, to love us, and to love you. There's another figure I want to put up here, and it's it's an important one, and it deals with this saving work of the coming Messiah. It's Jesus on a cross. How does Jesus come to save us? As a vulnerable child and a vulnerable victim of crucifixion. And in both ways, in a way, Jesus knows our shame. Jesus, who is hungry for our love and company, takes our shame upon himself. Jesus is rejected. He's rejected by those he came to love. They spit on him, mock him, strip him naked, and display his naked, beaten body for all to see. 
And on the cross, Jesus hears the harassing whisper, I'm not acceptable. I'm not good enough. Not important. And he felt the bitter curse of its judgment upon him. On the cross, Jesus hears the rumors of failure. And on the cross, he stared into the terrifying shadows of rejection and abandonment. And so he cries out, my God, my God, have you abandoned me? Jesus knows our shame because he took it to the cross. He came to forgive us our sin. You will name him Jesus, for he will save you from your sins. This is the third week of Advent. There's less than two weeks left to get ready for Christmas. For presents and gift giving and parties and baking and other stresses. But in the midst of all this, remember to think about God's hungry love. Remember how Jesus comes to us to forgive us. I want to share one more Advent tradition. It's a tradition my family practices around the dinner table when we light the Advent candles. We sing a song. And so kind of in the spirit of the family Von Trapp's uh, singers, I asked them to come and share this song for all of you. It's an old version of a Christmas carol called The Holly and the Ivy. Come on up. Uh, These are my three children, Lyndon, Liesel, and and Luca. And they're going to sing The Holly and the Ivy for us this morning. The holly and the ivy are dancing in a ring Round the merry purple candles and the white and shining king Oh, one is for the prophets and for the light they bring They are candles in the darkness, all alike for Christ the King And two for John the Baptist, he calls on us to sing Oh, prepare the way for Jesus Christ. He is coming, Christ the King. And three for Mother Mary. I cannot see the way, but you promised me a baby. I believe you, I obey. And for our God's people in every age and day, we are watching for his coming. We believe and we obey. And Christ is in the center, for this is his birthday. With the shining nights of Christmas, singing he has come today. Singing he has come today. Thank you very much. These practices are meant to kind of ask, are we ready? So are we ready? You are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. During this third week of Advent, as we prepare our our celebrations for the coming of Jesus, let's run from the powerful lies of sin and be embraced by a God who is hungry, who is hungry to love us this Christmas. A God who is desperate to not leave you alone and who goes to every length to embrace you. Merry Christmas. We have something to rejoice about. Pray with me. Gracious, <coughs> excuse me. Pray with me. Gracious Father, we give our thanks to you for you brought into being your glorious creation and crafted human life in your image. Your prophets promised that a virgin would conceive a son, the Messiah in whom your truth would live, God with us. Through John the Baptist, you remind us of the crippling effects of sin and how we are called to repent and turn toward your loving embrace. And through the voice of Mary, your Holy Spirit rejoiced in the wonder of the child eternally begotten of the Father. Fearless God, who came in a dream to Joseph, Dream through us anew today. 
speak into our places of fear and shame, transcend and transform all that keeps us from your intimate embrace. Cast out our sin and enter in and be born in us today. Dream into life in this very place, a church renewed by the leading of your spirit. Great Messiah, you came to save us from ourselves, to free us from our sins. You came to radically embrace us in love. And for that, we thank you, everlasting God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So now go in peace and ask yourself, is it true? Is it true? Does God have a hungry love for me? What does that mean? Is it true? Thank you.